today's reading is going to be out of Luke chapter 2, verses 22 through 40. This is God's word. And when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the wound shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord a pair of turtle doves, or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, He took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed. And a sword will pierce through his own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was eighty-four. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned unto Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. God's word. Thank you, Ben. I have to make do with water because I can't find my coffee cup right now. First time preaching without the microphone being a majigger, so I hope this works well. Um, we'll see how this goes. I can hear Vitaly great. Ben, not so much, but he's a quieter talker. I don't think that'll be a problem with me, but. Uh, Anyway, um, this is an encouraging passage, especially like, man, I wish we timed this so this is getting around Christmas time. We're like a month off in our calendar for the Christmas sermons, Uh, but this is a really beautiful passage, Um, and the title is For the Salvation of Many, and as we see today, we'll look and see kind of what that means, but this is the culmination of God's promises to his people to save them, to call them, to preserve them, and to make them right with God, so let's pray. Father God. Eternally grateful to you for, again, the ability to worship together. As Vitaly uh, uh, taught us just even winning the lottery of being here together in a free place where we can hear your word preached, we can fellowship with one another. Prepare our hearts for what you have for us, Lord God. In this we ask, amen. Okay, so as we get to today's passage, we're going to see four points. Again, they're outlined in the back of your bulletin if you want to follow along. Um, But we're going to see through this passage that the circle is complete. Kind of as we see through the path of history, this is the culmination of God's work in the lives of his people, Israel. We're going to see the providence of God at hand through Simeon and his promise, God's promise to him. Then we're going to look specifically at that phrase, the rise and fall of many. What does that mean? And then lastly, we're going to be encouraged to grow strong in the Lord. deacon right there. (laughs) Starting in verse 22. When they came, when the time came for the purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. 
So this is that first point. The circle is complete. We're going to look at this. Look at this purification ritual. Even how he opens up telling, again, his Gentile readers what Mary and Joseph had to do with this baby. This is coming to us from Exodus 13. And it's just written out there clearly if you open up and read it. Seven days after the birth of a male child, the woman is considered unclean. And on the eighth day, they're to take this child and circumcise him. Okay, so they circumcise this child on the eighth day. And then for 33 days afterwards, she is considered, again, unclean and purifying. And so, by the way, for females, that's two weeks of unclean and then 66 days. And we read here in Leviticus 12, verse 6. And when the days of her purifying are completed, whether for a son or for a daughter, she shall bring to the priest at the entrance of the tents, meeting a lamb, a year old for a burnt offering, and a pigeon, or a turtle dove for a sin offering. And he shall offer it before the Lord and make atonement for her. Then she shall be clean. So day 40, this is day 40, she now presents herself as clean and presents herself to the temple and this child. This is all very normal stuff. We did this every time we had a child here, right? Like, that's just what we do. No, no, this is clearly odd. This is abnormal for us. What's the point of all this? What's the point of looking at these Old Testament laws and rules? Right? And some of them, if you really get into Exodus, don't trim the sides of your beard. Right? Um, there's so many of these purification rituals, but we don't follow them today. We don't adhere to all of those or most of those. Um, but it's the same God. We as Christians acknowledge we worship this same God that chose Abraham, that called these people. We are grafted into that family. The reason is because God gave his law to his people at this time back when he made this promise to Abraham, to set them apart, to say, you, I am pulling you out of the world. You are mine. You are my chosen people. And to show them their need for a savior, their need for forgiveness or sin, their need for atonement because of their inability to fulfill that law perfectly. The entire Old Testament points to humanity's need for a savior. It is God's redemption plan. Right? And, and the fulfillment of God's plan for eternity for mankind is to live with his people in perfect harmony for eternity. That's where this is ending up. God chose his people, starting with his promises to Abraham, for no good reason other than his mercy. We read that, I think, in Genesis uh, 11 or 12. This is what he says, Abraham, I'm choosing you, and I'm making you a great nation. And then God lets... His chosen people fall into captivity in Egypt. And then he lets them, he leads them out through Moses. And through Moses, he gives them the law that they may be made right with God by obedience of this law, by forgiveness for the sins through animal sacrifice. And then we see the history of Israel. They sin and are punished. And then they cry out and they repent. And God sends someone to redeem them, to save them, a judge, a prophet. And then ultimately, God promised that he would send his Savior to make this permanent forgiveness of sin. Yet here we see in this passage right here, Mary, Mary is under this law. She is still fulfilling these rituals thousands, hundreds of years later after her people have practiced this forever. Right? And so here she is showing, too, that she is a sinner. She is following these purification rituals. And we see that Jesus is also born under the law. Matthew 5, 17. Jesus talking in the Sermon on the Mount says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Jesus did fulfill them. That's why we don't practice these Jewish customs given to Israel. right? We don't need rituals to perform so that we may be made right with God. We don't need to have an animal sacrificed and spill innocent blood so that we can yearly be made right with God and have forgiveness for our sins. This Savior that is being born to Mary right here is completing this work for us. Right? So as Mary follows this law, she brings Jesus to the temple. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. This is coming straight from Exodus 13. Consecrate to me all the firstborn. Whatever is the first to open the womb, man or beast. That firstborn terminology, do you guys realize where that's coming from here? 
But he pulled them out of Egypt. And in those final plagues, the ten plagues of Egypt, what was the final one? The, the death of the firstborn of Egypt. And how was, Israel, how was Israel's firstborn saved from that? By the blood of an innocent lamb spread over their doorpost to mark their alignment as a chosen people to God. Right? Jesus is this firstborn son of Mary. He is the son of God. He is consecrated to do his father's will. But he is born without sin. Born without sin, yet still born under the law of Moses. Right? And so even now, at his birth, even this prophetic, miraculous birth, they're still bringing these sacrifices. They're still bringing the turtle doves because they were poor. Even though her son, born, is the Messiah, the final sacrifice, even now, she is obedient. This is the circle being made complete with Jesus. With the birth and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. God's people, his chosen people, needed to make their atonement for this sin through their sacrifice, through all the law given to Moses, through their obedience. But now no longer do we need that. We have that final payment, that final reconciliation with God through Jesus Christ. Moving on to verse 25. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him in his arms and blessed God. So just looking at Simeon, by the way, this is our second point here, the providence of God. We're going to look at this chance encounter. But what does it tell us about Simeon? He's righteous and devout, and he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. The consolation of Israel. That, that literally means Jerusalem's redemption. He was waiting for the coming kingdom that all the Jews were waiting for at this time. The master's return. And we see he's a righteous man. He's old. He'd lived a long and faithful life, and somewhere along the way, God, the Holy Spirit, had promised him, you will not die until you see until you see the Christ. We don't know how long ago it was. It could have been some number of years ago you received this promise. It could have been last week. We don't know. But let's assume it was a, a somewhat of a length of time. He'd been holding on to this promise. He'd been holding on to this promise for whatever length of time that was, waiting for this. And here, by coincidence, by mere happenstance, he walks in the temple and he's like, oh, what timing. Just walks in and sees the baby Jesus. The phrase, the providence of God, providence of God, that's one I used to struggle with, honestly. I did. You know, the word providence, so we're all on the same page. You know, some definitions are foresight or management or guardianship. What God ordains, right? Like, how much is God in control of all things, right? I used to struggle with this, honestly. Does God really control the red lights as I'm driving down the street, right? Does God really care if I get this job or not. You know, some people want to say God is this, you know, guy out there who set the world in motion and we all just do our things and he's hands off. Look at this life in Simeon. Look at this example. Look at this coincidence. Some time ago, maybe years ago, God made this promise to Simeon. And on this very day, Simeon randomly woke up. Right? Maybe he slept in a bit. Maybe he got to the temple an hour earlier than he normally does. Maybe an hour later. We don't know. Maybe he goes once a week. Well, he probably goes more than once a week. But we don't know his day, his schedule. So he just randomly gets up and does his chores and heads over to the temple. Boom, runs into the baby Jesus. Think about the series of events that led up to everything in Simeon's life and on that day and that week. What if he'd been out of town? What if he'd been sick? What if someone else had been sick? What if his donkey broke down on the side of the road? Was he not feeling great and God woke him up and said, no, no, you got to get up today? Or did God divinely orchestrate all these things as he saw fit for the fulfillment of this promise? Even back when he made this promise to Simeon. I look at the example of Lazarus. You guys know the story of Lazarus. Lazarus, he was Mary and Martha's brother, dear friend of Jesus. We know Jesus loved this family. And they send word that Lazarus is sick. And so... Rather than rushing right over there to heal his friend, Jesus tells us delays a couple of days, 
sounds like he just moseys on over whenever he feels like it and eventually gets there and uh, Lazarus is dead, right? And of course we see, oh Lord, if you'd been here, he wouldn't have died. Really? And then we see him having a conversation with Mary and Martha and saying, do you believe me? Do you believe I am the son of God? And they, they declare they do. And then through the power of God, he calls Lazarus forth and raises him from the dead. Lazarus had been dead four days. He stinketh, the new king, the King James says. And yet here he comes, bundled up, alive and made well. Where's the providence of God in this? We see other examples. God could have spoken for a distance. Oh, Lazarus is sick. Boom, by the time you get home, he'll be healed. We know Jesus does that. Or he could have rushed. Hey, let's go. Let's drop everything we're doing. Get over there. At some time, people over here with Lazarus are watching him be sick and hurting and finally breathing his last and they're mourning and they're anointing him with oils and they're doing their ceremonial rituals. They're wrapping up dead Lazarus. Did Lazarus get sick accidentally? Did he die accidentally? Or did all this happen so that the power over death may be revealed by Jesus? We want to believe that we have so much control and we're logical human beings with complete autonomy, right? And we make decisions all day, every day. We make great decisions. We make really, really, really dumb decisions. But we have those power of all the decisions in our life that we make. But do you believe the Bible is the word of God? I see some heads nodding. That's good. Do you believe it when Jesus himself says not a sparrow falls from the sky apart from my father? Much less Lazarus, Lazarus, beloved friend of Jesus. Did he die apart from the will of the father? You can't believe those words that I just said and then think, oh, but he doesn't care if I get this job. He doesn't care about my financial situation. He doesn't care about my sickness. Whatever's going to happen is going to happen. Christian, take comfort in the fact that God has a plan for your life and God has a promise for your life. The easiest way I can say it is don't worry, be happy. Honestly, Romans 8.28 tells us, for we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Let me read that again. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Do you believe that? Does anyone want to stand up in here right now and challenge that sentence? I'm glad no one's standing up, by the way. Let the record show no one stood up. God works all things. What things? All things. That was our first audience participation. That wasn't even intentional, but I'm glad that worked out. God works all things. For what end? For good. And for who? For those who are called according to his purpose. God works all things for good. For us. Us as children. This is for Simeon's good. What we see here today. This is for Mary's good. This is for the good of all those witnesses around there. Right? And none of this is accidental. God does what God does. You can take that to the bank. And you can fight it. And you can try and control it. The only real question is. How your heart is. How your disposition towards God is. Are you going to be blessed and glorify God? Or are you going to be impatient and worry and stress and try to control everything yourself? Be mired in fear and anxiety and doubt? Getting worked up all the time, trying to micromanage and control everything and being disappointed every time things don't go your way? Or are you going to be able to let go and let God? It's tough. It is tough. Trust me, I know this. right? I'm a, micro, I'm a control enthusiast myself. I get this. But, it, but truly, this is, this is the God we're talking about. God is big. We are small. Please take a load off your mind and put a little faith in the creator of the universe. Moving on to Simeon's blessing here. Verse 29. Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples. A light of revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and mother marveled at what was said about him. So here's Simeon, this old man. God, I'm coming home. Finally, my eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Simeon knows this is the Christ. 
You have sent this baby. You have sent the Christ to be the salvation of all peoples, Jews and Gentiles. This is weird, by the way. This is weird. Simeon is a devout Jew spending his days in the temple, right? And I'm not saying they're angry people, but there was no love for the Gentiles, for the Romans, for those around and the Greeks, right? All these other people groups, those are Gentiles. And Simeon was a devout servant of the Lord, a devout Jew, and he was waiting like all Jews were for the promised one, for this Messiah. And most often they thought this was going to be some guy coming in to throw off the shackles of oppression, overthrow the Roman government, give them their place in prominence, right? Maybe he thought this promise meant that he would see long enough to see this man rise up and get an army behind him and start marching like the old Israelites did. And again, he walks in by God's providence that day in the temple. Walks in and you can just see this instantly, he knows. This is the Son of God. You know, that same Holy Spirit who promised that he wouldn't die until he saw the Messiah fills him right here. Lightning bolt to the heart. There he is. That's the Son of God. You know, the Savior of the world. The promise of Israel. The light of, for revelation to the Gentiles. In this instant, in this encounter, this lightning bolt in Simeon's heart, he sees or feels, not in detail, but in spirit, God's plan for redemption to build the bridge that will close the gap between God and man, to fulfill the promise of your people Israel, but also to bring Gentiles into the fold. This is the wow part of this. Simeon would not have instantly gone to the Gentiles, but yet here he is, seeing that this is a plan for redemption for all people. And of course, Mary and Joseph marvel at this, right? They've already had a pretty wacky experience up until now, just so we're clear, right? Up to the last year was pretty normal, and then the last year has gone off the road, man. Mary, an angel, you're going to have, a, 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 you're going to be, become pregnant miraculously, and that child will be the Christ. And Joseph, hey, hey, this young lady that you're getting married to is with child, but don't worry, right? And then to go out there and to go to Bethlehem and to have the shepherds come in and say, uh, uh, by the way, a billion angels just came and told us that the Messiah is right here, right? Like, they've already had an experience up to this point with everything that went on with Zechariah and Elizabeth, right? And now, even at Simeon's word, they marveled at what was said about him. Like, this is even more proof of the hand of God. It's not one thing, and then kind of dies down. It wasn't one promise where they can say, well, that was really weird, but that's what happened, and begin to doubt. No, continual affirmation and confirmation to solidify in their hearts that this is the fulfillment of God's promise to come. This is a key point. They know this. Many at the time knew this, as we'll see kind of later on. Verse 34, And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that the thoughts for many hearts may be revealed. Again, this takes a different turn than the blessing we saw of Zechariah and the blessing we see of Mary and Elizabeth, right? He will be opposed. A, soul, a sword will pierce through your soul. This child is appointed for the rise and fall of many in Israel. He will be opposed so that all will be made right in this world. So that everyone will live in peace and harmony? No, it says he will be opposed so that the thoughts from many hearts will be revealed. This is the truth of the magnitude of what we're looking at. And we teach this regularly. Jesus didn't come all eight pounds, eight ounce baby Jesus. All super cute and cuddly laying next to the baby sheep in the manger. He didn't come just to bring warm and fuzzies to everyone. Can't we all just get along? I hate to say this, but this is the false gospel that's watered down by the church today. That we're all here for roses and puppy dogs. But, but the truth is we are salmon swimming upstream. We are going against the culture. We are going against the current. John 15 tells us this. If the world hates you, this is Jesus speaking, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. 
If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Why was that young pastor shot in the head for preaching? He didn't do anything individually to anyone. The world hates the truth. The world hates Jesus. The world hates the gospel. Some actively, some passively. Follow along this train of thought here, okay? Matthew 10. Right, we alluded to that earlier. It says, not a sparrow falls from the sky, not a hair falls from your head outside of the will of God. Okay, right? We all agree to that. No one stood up to challenge that. Okay, God is in control. Next verse, right after that, do not think I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set man against his father and daughter against her mother. Jesus did not come to make nice and sing kumbaya. Jesus did not come to bring peace on earth to the world's ways and ends. Jesus came with a sword. And if you don't believe me, look around at this world today. Do you see a ton of peace, brothers and sisters? Has there been peace on this earth since that proclamation by those angels? Right? Like we saw last week, Scott preached Luke 2, 14, glory to God. Peace on earth among those whom he is pleased. This is a sad reality, but it's a righteous reality. Not everyone. Those who put their faith and trust in him. And by the way, that peace can be tenuous even in our own lives, is it not? The, I'm not afraid of this. The non-Christian left wants to kind of use our Bible against us and they want to say phrases about love how we are to uh, interact with homelessness or immigrants or sexual deviancy, right? That's, that's what the, those who are outside of the faith want to use. They want to say, God is love, right? Love is love. But the fact is, God is love, 100%. We will be known as his disciples for our love for one another. His love was demonstrated with us when he sent his son to die and lay down his life for our sins. But the fact is, Jesus came to bring righteousness and salvation. Jesus came to make atonement for our sins. Jesus came to make those who would believe be right with God, to have forgiveness of sins. Right? And right here we see, and for those who don't believe, well, he came for the rise and fall of many. He came that the hearts of men may be revealed. But there is hope. He says, I come to bring a sword, but the very next verse, 39, whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. That's it. This is it. The Holy Spirit, he fills Simeon and he says, this child is appointed for the rise and fall of many in Israel. He will be opposed. He will be violently opposed unto, the, unto death. And the hearts and thoughts of many will be revealed. We saw this when Jesus preached in his ministry, and I'm sure we'll see over the coming months, he does great works. He preaches love and forgiveness to those in sin, those in wicked sin. And he'll heal a man with a withered hand. And some will see that and say, go out and seek to destroy him. That is their heart and their thought being revealed. This is not about peace on earth, goodwill towards men. This is about God's righteous, just, merciful plan from the beginning of time being fulfilled. This circle being, a, being made complete right here with this child. And you know what? Some, by God's grace, will believe and be forgiven of their sin and have eternal life. And some will hate him and oppose him. And the darkness of their thoughts and their hearts will be revealed. But the good news is the story does not end there. Yes, Jesus came to be that final atonement for sin, that final sacrifice. Jesus came to bring salvation to Jews and Gentiles alike. Every tribe and tongue and nation. Jesus came to expose this division, the truth in the hearts of men, right? And the wicked and the unrepentant and opposition to him, but also to be that final reward for those who believe and are called according to his purpose. That we've been studying Matthew 10, right? Here we go. Follow along with me. I got you. Not a sparrow falls from my head, but I came to bring sword and not peace. And whoever finds his life will lose it again. In the very next verse, verse 40, whoever receives me, receives him who sent me. This is the hope. This is the gospel message that is out there. 
You don't have to stand in opposition to Christ. You don't have to sit there opposing him in your sin and your wickedness. John 3.16 tells us, whoever believes in me shall have eternal life. Yes, yes, every one of us. Everyone in this room can sit here hearing this promise and they can own it. They can make it theirs. How? By believing, by repenting of their sin, by putting their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. By saying, Jesus, you are the Savior, you're the Messiah, you're the only path to salvation. This is it. There's no magic to it. You can be that whoever. Whoever believes, that could be you. By the grace of God, that is many of us. You can be that whoever in the whoever receives portion of this. Trust the God who divinely created his plan from the beginning of time. Trust the God who sent his son to die on the cross for those who would believe. Trust that God doesn't do accidents. That even sitting here in this room is not an accident. Rather, trust that God has a purpose for you. Right here, right now. Verse 36. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. Man, God loves to move in old people, doesn't he? (laughs) Here's some amen from uh, some people. 84 years serving this temple for over 60 years, faithfully worshiping God, fasting and praying constantly. Very similar to what we see in Simeon, very similar to what we saw in Elizabeth and Zechariah. She walks right up, miraculously, right? God's providence, God's blessing in her life to come up at that very hour. That she should be there to give praise and honor to God. But what does it say she does? She shares this good news with all those who are waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. Spreading, tapping everyone on the shoulder. Guys, this is it. This is the Savior. We saw this with John and his birth, with the muteness of his father, the advanced years of his mother, and how God even laid the foundation for those who would be able to start putting this away in their brain when John started his ministry. Even now, very similar, she begins to speak to all those waiting for the redemption of Israel. Everyone was waiting for the redemption of Israel at this time. Everyone is waiting for the Messiah, much like we are today saying, this world is harsh, this world is ugly, this world is getting worse and worse and worse. God, save us, come back. Israel, at this time, same thing. So everyone within earshot, everyone who hears of these events, 30 years from now, Jesus will walk on this earth, well, at this timeline, right? 30 years from this timeline, Jesus will walk on this earth and perform miracles and call those to repentance of sin. And even then, they will say, I remember this birth. I remember this, I remember this old lady, Anna, saying these things to me. There are going to be those who remember the stories of the shepherds and the stories of Zechariah and Elizabeth and Anna. These are not accidental encounters. This is all part of God's plan to soften the hearts of many, to hear and receive him as their savior. What a wonderful thing that God is working and orchestrating even just through blessing these old faithful believers in God, servants of God, and then spreading that word to the people who would hear him. Verse 39, moving on to our last point, grow strong in the Lord. Verse 39 says, And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. So after everything that happened, everything they'd gone through, Jesus, they went home, and Jesus grows up and is filled with wisdom, filled with the favor of God. That seems a little obvious. The favor of God was on his son, who was the son of God, the Messiah, the one who he had planned since the beginning of time for this moment in redemptive history. Yes, I believe the favor of God is on him. I don't struggle with that verse. 
Jesus publicly flew under the radar for 30 years. Do you guys realize that? Privately, privately, those in his life, they knew something. Mary knew something, I promise you. Joseph knew something. Many knew Jesus was set aside. They knew he was not like other children. We see this, we'll see this, I think, next week when Jesus is in the temple at age 12. How unfair was that? We know he has brothers, earthly brothers through Joseph and Mary, James. How unfair was that? Why can't you be more like your brother Jesus? Jesus was filled with the spirit at a young age. In his early life, he was fully God, but also he was man, fully man, human in body and mind. Jesus did chores. Jesus worked with his father, the carpenter. Jesus went to the synagogue faithfully as a good Jewish child would, but he did this in perfection. He never sinned. He never talked back to his mom. He never lied when he was asked if he fed the donkey or not. Jesus had a good reputation among all who knew him. We are not Jesus. Right? I mean, that's not exactly earth-shattering news from the preacher right now. But we are a reflection of him. We take on the name of Christ when we call ourselves a Christian. We have this Holy Spirit living inside of us, guiding us, leading us, encouraging us. Brothers and sisters, grow strong. Grow strong in wisdom. Grow strong in knowledge. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Seek to do better in all you do, not for earthly material gains, but to honor God. Work is unto the Lord. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Be honorable. Don't lie. Don't get mad when you lose a board game or video game. Grow in knowledge and understanding. In Scripture, yes. In the Word of God, in fellowship, in prayer, so that you may bring honor and glory to the name of Christ. As we are promised, God will reward your righteousness. Live well for the glory of God. Honor him with your words and your deeds that many may see the working of God in your life and be drawn to the creator of the universe, the Messiah, the Savior of our sins, the way, the truth, and the life. Let's pray. Our gracious God above, we are grateful for this time in your word, for the promises you have for us, for the promises you fulfilled to your people, to the fact that you've grafted us non-Hebrews into your fold, into your family, onto your tree of life. Preserve us, Lord God, as we go about our days and our weeks. In your name we pray, amen.